Well, I'm glad you're here today, and hopefully by the end of the service, you'll be glad that you were here. I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn them to the book of James. That's where we're at. We're walking through the book of James, and this particular series, as Jeremy mentioned, as you just saw, is titled Simple Faith. Simple Faith. I've got a question for you. I don't want you to answer out loud, but have you ever, at a time in your life, had an experience where you were waiting in line for something and someone cut in front of you. Oh man, I can hear the frustration already. Don't get angry thinking about it. But I mean, I remember growing up as a kid, uh, you know, when, when other kids would cut in line, typically we would yell to the teacher. We didn't call her by her name. Where I grew up, I grew up down in South, South Texas, we typically called teachers, miss, miss, miss. So, so you would hear kids say, miss, miss, they cut it at it, they cut it at it, you know. It, we were still working on our English, all right? So, but I mean, we didn't want someone cutting in line for lunch or recess or whatever it is. But, you know, even as adults, we probably experienced that at maybe an amusement park when you were waiting in line and someone acted like they knew someone in front of you and they just want to go around you real quick. Or maybe you've been at the Houston Rodeo waiting in those long lines to get into the, to the rodeo and you see people kind of going around and like, whoa, hey, whoa, hey, we were waiting here too or whatever it is. Or, you know, God forbid, if you've, if you've ever gotten up early on a Black Friday to wait in line to get into a store, that's when it gets ugly, right? I mean, it's, it's bad. Or my least favorite or probably one of my greatest pet peeves is when there's traffic and someone thinks they are more important than everyone else and so they drive on the shoulder to get about four or five cars up and then they start ooching their way back into the line, right? Don't be that person, all right? Why? Because I'm the guy that when I see that happening, I slowly move over onto the shoulder to block that person. Now, I know that they appreciate it because they always wave at me (laughs) with one finger, but they're always waving at me. And, and so I know they're grateful for me doing that, but, uh, but I, I don't know about you, but I've actually had those different kind of experiences happen more times than I care to admit. Uh, you know, as you, as you may or may not know, even traveling overseas, uh, you might not have ever experienced this, but you can go to some countries where uh, people from other countries think they're more important than you, you know, especially if they find out you're an American. They, they, you know, I know a lot of people think highly of America. There are some places that don't, right? And so they're, they're thinking, oh, you're, you're a snobby American. I'm going to get in front of you. Or because of my country and where I come from, my people group are more important than a lot of folks. And so we deserve to be put in the front of the line or we deserve to get our luggage first or we deserve to get through customs first, whatever it may be. And again, it's, it's just, it kind of creates some uh, struggle within us when those kind of things happen, when those happen. And to me, those dark places that we really don't want to admit, we we have this tendency to think more highly of ourselves and think less of other people. And it's ugly. But we, we have this tendency to lean toward the reality that we do show preference to some people and we show indifference to other people. So as we continue in this series called Simple Faith, I want to talk about this aspect of our faith walk that can be oftentimes overlooked and maybe even justified at times. In fact, I want to get right to the punchline of my message today, and hopefully me giving you the punchline doesn't cause you to go, okay, I'm out of here, I can go to lunch early. And it's not something new that you've never heard before, but this is the punchline of my message, and it's this. People matter to God. People matter to God. All, all people 
matter to God. Now, James, he says it this way in James 2. I want to look at this verse and then we'll jump into the whole passage. But verse 8 says this. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, read this yellow part out loud with me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing, re- you are doing well. So James is saying, hey, if, you'll, if you're fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, and the, you know, the, the reason it's called the royal law is that Jesus emphasized this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. If you are fulfilling the royal law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing really well. I mean, it's important. Now, the goal behind this series of messages is that Oftentimes in our faith walk with Jesus, we try to make it a whole lot more difficult and hard than it really is. And what we're trying to communicate in this series is that in reality, our faith is a simple faith. And one aspect of our simple faith that James is talking about and about our journey with Jesus is that we need to understand that people matter to God. Therefore, of course, it's understood if they matter to God, they should matter to us. So let's look at what James has to say about this, and we'll unpack this. So James chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this good place, while you say to the poor man, uh, You stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to those who who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, James doesn't mince words here, in my opinion. In fact, in the very first verse, James addresses them. He says, brothers, so he's, he's speaking to fellow believers. These, of course, are, as we've talked about, these are people that have been under persecution and things like that, but they are still fellow believers, and James speaks to them, and he says, brothers, and then he immediately says, show no partiality. This is not a suggestion from James. This is not one of those moments where James is going, hey, if you think about it, or, you know, if it pops into your head, or, or you know, if the situation comes up, you ought to show no partiality. No, really, this is a command. Show no partiality. And he immediately ties it, and this is what I don't want you to miss when we're talking about this idea of simple faith. He immediately ties it to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because he says... You show no partiality 
as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is basically putting us on the spot to say, if you are going to be living out your faith, one of the simplest things you can do in your faith walk is to not be partial to other individuals. Then he gives a very specific illustration. Now, we might... uh, Let's talk about the illustration. I'll talk about how we might uh, get a little uh, confused about it. He says, And suppose a rich man uh, comes into your church. He says the word assembly, but your church. A rich man comes in, and the reason he's distinguished as a rich man is he's wearing a gold ring and wearing fine clothing. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but the gold ring is kind of a, James is stepping it up a little bit about this person. This is not just someone who who has nice clothes, although that it, back in those days, that was a sign of wealth. But the very idea that this guy is wearing a gold ring is a big deal. Now to us, that's not as big of a deal nowadays. Why? I'm, I got a gold ring on. It's my wedding band. Not, you know, trust me, I don't really put myself up in the top 1%. But I have a gold ring. So it's not as big of a deal to us nowadays. Maybe today the better way to look at that is maybe someone who, who is wearing a, a, maybe a, a very expensive watch. Or, no offense ladies, maybe there's a designer handbag on the outside. Everybody's got to see it. You know, and it's actually not one of the knockoffs. So he says, this person comes in to your assembly and you immediately recognize them as a person of wealth or maybe a person of influence. And it doesn't just stop there, but you offer them preferred seating because of the way that they look. And then he also uses a poor man in shabby clothes. And you say to the poor man, hey, I got a spot for you. It's in the back. Or you can, man, this just sounds harsh to me. You can sit at my feet. James is making a very extreme distinction between these two. But the He nails the coffin shut by saying, you really give preference to the rich guy and you show indifference to the poor guy. Now, before we start thinking too high and mighty of ourselves, because I'll be honest with you, when I was reading this story, me personally, I can't speak for you, But for me personally, I was thinking, man, this is a pretty extreme illustration. I mean, because I don't really believe, now I'm I'm hoping in the goodness of myself, but I really don't believe that I would intentionally do that in a physical way. In other words, in this church, I I don't think that you know, I, oh, someone comes in here, you sit up here, and someone else comes in, doesn't look like them, oh, you sit over there. I, I, and I, I hope that's not what we even present at our church. I, I hope that we're presenting that each and every person, no matter who they are, are welcome. Just come, be a part, and, and join in. But I don't think it's as much about appearance that James is even taught. And I I even, this is where I kind of wrestle with it. I don't even know that James is trying to emphasize the action. In other words, you sit over there, you sit over here, blah, blah, blah. Here's what I think James is mentioning, and I don't want you to miss this. This is important. I think James is saying that maybe this illustration, maybe this idea of partiality is not so much about action as much as it is attitude. 
Don't miss that. It's not so much about action as it is attitude. This idea of seeing someone and thinking of them in a certain way based on their outward appearance. Now, we could get into, and some, you know, trust me, as I was studying this, there, a lot of different commentators get into the whole idea, the, the biblical significance of the poor and the biblical significance of the rich. And I don't, I don't want to get muddled into all that, not that it's not important, but, you know, sometimes we, we want to separate those out and, and, and dig in deep on those. The, the point is, in my opinion, very simple. And that is, our faith walk should cause us to see that all people matter to God. Not just people that we feel like we can uh, personally benefit from. And as we'll see in a moment, it may even be people that are in need of something that they don't even deserve. We'll see that in a second. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, or it shouldn't matter, what a person's social economic status is. It really shouldn't matter what a person's race is. It really shouldn't matter, uh, this may be hard for some of y'all, it really shouldn't matter what a person's political persuasion is. It doesn't matter what neighborhood they live in. It doesn't matter what kind of car they drive or don't drive. We need to see that people are people and that all people matter to God. Now, it's hard. Let's just be honest. It's hard. Because whether we care to admit it or not, In some of the darkest places of our hearts, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, we categorize people. I mean, I'll be honest, I caught myself recently in a conversation with some individuals, they were talking about uh, their children going away to college and, and, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was pretty interested in that, and I was just kind of hearing what was going on, and they never said the college, but then they finally did, and it was like, it was like one of these really prestige, prestigious colleges. And I'll be honest with you, in that moment, I thought, woo, you know, I mean, I didn't do that. <laughs> Trust me, I didn't do that. But I was thinking, what, what, you know, I think there's some pretty good schools right here in Texas. Why well, you got to go out of state to that place? Y'all must be, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm confessing some ugliness that I was feeling in that moment. I'm thinking, what's wrong with Harvard on the Hill right here? Lee College, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a product over there, some of that, right? Maybe that's not a good example, but uh, <laughs> I mean, some of y'all, y'all, y'all think there's, there's some school up there in College Station, A&M or something, pretty good school, right? I'm really shocked there was no whoop in that moment. <laughs> and there's no A&M people in the room? I'm sh- oh, okay. I, I was ashamed for a minute there. Or then there's that other school that... People say you should cut the horns off of that schools. I'm just saying what I hear on the streets. But in that moment, what I'm just saying to you, I'm just admitting an ugly side, I immediately started creating in my mind an idea of who this guy was simply because he told me where his kid was going to school. Now maybe, maybe you're better than me at that. But isn't it interesting when we maybe hear what someone does for a living, we think, wow, they must be really important when this person does this. And we go, oh, I mean, that's a good job, but it's not what this guy's doing. Or we hear someone say, hey, I live over here on this side of town. Ooh, (laughs) okay. 
I'll never forget. I think I told this story before. It's just funny how we create within our own minds uh, what people ought to be or we picture them. Yeah. So one day, uh, years and years ago, I used to drive this uh, big, ugly, blue Ford F-250. Now you go, why? Because it was paid for. That's why. Yeah. And it, it drank gas like no man's business. And, uh, but I drove this truck. So one day I'm leaving the church. I'm the last one to leave. And I'm walking out to my truck and this guy pulls in. And uh, so he rolls down his window and I'm standing beside the truck and he says, hey, you know, can you tell me about this church? I said, well, yeah, you know, what, what kind of church is it? And I, I'm telling him and, you know, what kind of music they have? And I'm telling him, he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm working down here. I'm, I'm from out of town, but I'm working a job. I'm be here for a while. I'm looking for a church and da, 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 da. And, and, and so we're talking about it. And then he goes, well, do you go to church here? I said, yeah, yeah, I go to church here some, you know. <laughs> And then finally, finally it gets out. He goes, I said, well, actually, I'm the pastor of the church. And he went, really? Now, I don't know if I should have been offended in that moment. <laughs> but he said, really? And I said, well, yeah. And he goes, this is literally what he said next. And you drive that? <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, what, what's wrong? And he goes, man, well, this looks like a pretty big church, man. He would, shouldn't you drive something a little, I mean, literally, this is what he would say. Shouldn't you be driving something a little nicer? I said, well, I'm not that kind of pastor. Sorry. It's just, that's not where I fit. And even in that moment, did you see what I just did? I showed partiality even in my statement back and actually a statement of pride. Isn't it silly how easy we slip into that? And James says, but it's a simple faith. And the simplicity of our faith is that we ought to see people as God sees people. He loves them no matter what. They matter to him. And I mean, if we're honest, this would be an easy concept to live out in our minds <laughs> If they look like us and dress like us and lived like us and behaved like us. But those that don't, we kind of. So remember what James said in verse eight. We looked at it a second ago. We look back down at it. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing really well. In other words, James says, if you're, if you're following this law laid down as the royal law by Jesus. You're really doing good if you're loving your neighbor as yourself. But don't miss verse 9. Right after verse 9, he says, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You're missing it, is what he's saying. You're missing it. If, if, if you... If you think you're doing well by loving your neighbor as yourself, oh, got that one checked off, God. But you're showing partiality, you're missing it. And can we just all be honest for a moment? Probably far more times than we care to admit, we miss it. We miss the simplicity of our faith. Well, then he makes it really clear, really clear. Look, look down, verses 10 through 12. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, so, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Now, I think it's interesting that James uses this idea because he starts talking about, man, you can keep this law of loving your neighbor as yourself, but if you, don't, if you miss one of the other laws, then you're guilty of all of it. And that, you know, that kind of sounds harsh, but let's be honest, 
It's exactly what we believe about sin. It's like, how many sins does it take to make you a sinner? Anybody know that answer? One. Our kids think, you know, well, hey, give me a little slack, right? And isn't it funny how we even try to categorize sin? Like we'll say, well, you know, that, that wasn't a blatant lie. It was a little white lie. And I think it's interesting that James uses these two, what I would consider, and probably what everybody in the room would consider, as big sins. Because he says, he who ever says, well, he who ever said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you're still guilty. And you go, man, that, uh, I've never had a problem with either, right? I mean, never committed adultery, never murdered anyone. Well, do you, don't forget, <laughs> Jesus said, if you have anger in your heart, it's just like murder. James knew that. So James is drawing the line between the two and helping them understand that even if you have hate in your heart, you're a murderer. And even if you want to pat yourself on the back for not being an adulterer, you're a murderer, you're guilty of it all. And what's interesting is James is driving this home, don't miss it. And he's only really trying to make one point. And the point was, People matter to God. Don't show partiality. Treat people the same. In your faith walk. And can I just challenge you that probably one of the greatest ways that people will see Christians different than the world is how we treat other people. Not by how well we tell them how much we disagree with them or tell them how bad they are, if we just treat other people with respect, if we love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves without showing partiality, I think we might make a major headway in our faith walk and, and even spreading the gospel. So let's look at the last verse. And this is where it just kind of comes all together in my opinion. James says, verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has no mercy. You hear that? Judgment is without mercy for the one who has shown no mercy. And mercy always triumphs over judgment. You do understand the concept of mercy. At least I hope you do. I want to remind you. Mercy is when you don't get something you deserve. Very simply put, you jump out on the road today and the speed limit sign says 45 and you're doing 60 and the police officer pulls you over and tells you, you know, you know why I pulled you over? And hopefully you're not one of these guys, you know, that now wants to argue about everything. But you go, yeah, I, 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 I was distracted. Maybe you have a, a reason. You know, I, I was speeding. And he goes, you're right. You were doing 60 in a 45. Give me your information. I'll get back to you. He goes back to his car comes back up to your car and he says I'll use me Tommy Mr. Clements you were going 60 in a 45 and you deserve X ticket but I've decided to give you a warning that's mercy that's mercy I deserve the ticket but he gave me mercy instead I'm afraid I'm afraid that the world only hears judgment at times from Christ's followers when they are in need of mercy. 
And I'm not saying we overlook things and we just become mamby pamby or what, you know, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is we oftentimes are better known for what we are against than what we are for. And what I believe God wants us to be for are people. Just people. Because they matter to him. And they should matter to us. So my challenge to you this week is this. And this is not going to be easy. You are going, because we, I think this happens daily, you're going to be faced with an opportunity this week of whether or not you are going to pass judgment and show partiality towards someone or whether or not you will give mercy. And my challenge to you this week is that you would contemplate the words of James who says, my dear brothers, Show no partiality as you walk in faith with your Lord Jesus Christ. The team's about to come and they're going to lead us in a closing song, but I want to close us out in prayer. Would you bow with me? And God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the words of James and the challenge that they are to me personally. God, I just confess to you how easy it is to slip into a mode of partiality and without even intending it but just to do it and as a result I'm not really loving my neighbor as much as I love myself because I'm loving myself more in that moment and so God I pray that we as your followers would act in simplistic faith And grant mercy to those who are in desperate need of it. Mercy that all of us, hopefully, at one time experienced from you through the blood of your Son on the cross. Even though we deserved hell, you offered us heaven. In Jesus' name.